everyone welcome. Um, I think that's everybody here you now. Can you hear me all right? Yeah? Okay, we didn't want to do mics, we thought we'd make it nice and formal. So, I'm Jan Lowe, um, I'm learning technologist here at Dundee and Angus College, so I'd just like to welcome you all to Dundee and Angus College. Um, I'm also on the Committee of All Scotland, and when we had our online meeting and trying to decide to have this event this year, I timidly said, would you like to have it at Dundee and Angus College? And everybody said, yes, please. So, welcome, we hope you'll enjoy the building today and enjoy the event. And others in our team are here, and you'll hear um, Joy telling you later about our learning lab, which is very exciting. At the moment, we are not expecting any fire drills or fire alarms, so if you do hear any fire alarms, there's a fire exit here and here. Lunch will be served where we have coffee, and ladies and gents are out there as well. Okay, if you get lost, just ask somebody where the atrium is, and that's what we generally call that area. And I think that's all we wanted to say to welcome you. Um, I'll hand over to Linda and Joe, who are going to tell you a little bit about Alt Scotland and what we've been doing. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Linda Craner from Glasgow Caledonia University. And I'm Joe Wilson, I'm a freelance educational <laughs> consultant now. <laughs> so we're both co chairs of Alt Scotland at the moment. So it's good to see you all. This has become a kind of annual event for us. It's our main face-to-face -face event of the year. So it's really good to get the chance to share what we're doing. And it's all about sharing today. It's sharing stories about how we're trying to enable and drive learning technology in our own institutions. So we look forward very much to hearing about what everyone's doing. Joe, I don't know if you want to say anything. I, I think it's just significant that we've got, we've got all to, to college. Uh, I, th I think the next bit of all of this are our college and university colleagues working more, more closely together. Uh, I'm a great advocate of open education and opening up educational resources. And I think the only way we can make this actually happen is, 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 is with college learning technologists and you, you talk to college technologists and, and university learning technologists working working together. Because if we're not if we're not doing that, we're not getting that pathway we need. We need for learners, which is really what, what, what it's all about. So it's great that we're, we're in a college uh, and that we get colleagues working between between the two sectors. Uh, it's, it, it's badly needed. Yeah, thanks, Joel. <coughs> Just a reminder of what we're doing in all Scotland. Um, we've actually done quite a lot. Some of it's behind the scenes, some of it, you know, more people have been involved with. But um, we do have a voice, and I think it's really useful to remind ourselves of that. We do have a voice, and we can actually make a difference to the educational scene in Scotland. So this is just some examples of some things we've been doing over the last year or so. So input to policy, we've certainly been pushing on that um, since we were established, really. And we responded to the Scottish Government consultation on the development of the digital learning strategy and that response is still available I think on the old website in the repository if you want to have a look at that. Um, as Joe says we're very um, keen on open education as well and that's been a, a strong focus for the group over the last couple of years. So there was input to OER Scotland, uh, sorry OER 16 which was in Edinburgh in April and quite a number of our our members were involved in that. Um, yeah, new partnership with the College Development Network, and we're also in regular touch with other organisations across Scotland. And I was pleased to hear that there was a good response from members in Scotland to the Alt Survey this year, because that's an important snapshot of where things are going in the sector. And um, I'm also told that there is a continuing increase in the uptake of CMALT, Certified Membership of ALT, in the Scottish sector. And that's really good to see as well. It's something that's now been promoted in institutions. And I know certainly in their own institution, if we're putting in a, a job description around learning technology, CMALT is part of that. So it's gradually beginning to uh, get into people's um, mindsets in terms of the importance of it and it's useful to see that going ahead. And also involvement in the Blended Learning Essentials MOOC that some of you may have um, seen. I don't know if any of you actually took it and then to get involved in that at all. 
think we say how much it starts next month. Right, as long as it starts the of July, uh, second iteration. If you haven't been involved in it, then have a look because um, it's aimed at um, further education, particularly, but I think it's of general interest across the sectors from schools to higher education. It's free, obviously. It's a MOOC on Future Learn, and that's it. Blended Learning Essentials also got an input to that, including. I think it's Scotland. not for you, for your peers, to get people switched on, to get them mm -hmm. under and get them support beyond the organisation. Yeah. Okay, shall I hand over to Martin then, Joan? I, su I suppose one, one bit, the, the, the government was meant to publish a paper on June on the way forward, and it's not appeared yet, so keep your eye out. Uh, and I think, I, I fear it will mainly be schools focused, they're still debating around that glow, glow, glow space, but I think that, that publication was certainly meant to be out at the beginning, beginning of June, but I've seen it appearing, so it'll probably appear just, it's probably appear just a little bit going holiday, as, as normal as And just before I shut up as well, uh, just to say that if anybody wants to contact Martin, he's available on Facebook, he's available on Twitter, he's available and that leads on nicely, um, uh, Blended Learning Essentials, one of the partners for that is Borders College. And um, so it's nice to have uh, Scotland part of that uh, project. So as Linda mentioned, the, the course materials are all uh, available in Future Learn, um, so you can take it. Added bonus news, if you're from a college and you're interested in um, doing uh, a CMOP, so getting a certified membership of if you take the blended learning learnings uh, essential course you enter from a college, you can get a 20% discount on your CMO uh, registration, and that's valid up until January next year. So there's information about that on the old website, or just grab me, uh, and I can give you more information about that. Just to give you some wider context, so uh, my name is Mark Hoxie, and I actually work for OPS. Um, all has a very small staff team of about four people based in Oxford, but I'm based in Scotland. And um, Alt Scotland has been uh, a, a very strong group and um, for a number of years now. And we're actually expanding to more groups across the UK, similar to Alt Scotland. Um, you know, I think the trustees and the executive within the association saw what was going on in Scotland and thinking. Oh, we should do this in more regions. So that's going to happen. And what that also means is there's going to be more support for groups like this, uh, including uh, online spaces um, to, for you to um, actually discover more about who's uh, interested in the association within your uh, in your region, within your institution. So uh, you should see more information about this coming out over the remainder part of the year. It would. Um, it would the, I can't go anywhere without saying if you're not a member of all, you should be joining as a member, it's a wonderful organisation. I'm, uh, I was a member of the association before I became a member of staff, so I can say that from the heart, honest. Uh, and if your organisation is a member of Alt, you can join for free, so there's more information about that on the website. Just a couple of things that are coming up, hopefully you're familiar with the Alt Annual Conference, a uh, free day event where um, we pulled together um, a number of people from the community interested in how technology can be used to enhance learning and teaching. Uh, this year it's at Warwick, um, 68th September. Uh, I appreciate that it's um, perhaps for a lot of you quite an expensive trip down and it perhaps doesn't fit in with um, your, your calendars in terms of uh, you know, starting the new academic year. Uh, if you want to uh, Get their cheap. Like for the Learning <laughs> Technologist of the Year Award, because uh, you get a free ticket to the conference, plus a thousand pounds if you come first. So the award is open to individuals, so you can submit yourself or you can submit on behalf of your team. Uh, so I think there's two tickets if you uh, submit as a team. Uh, there's more information on the website. The uh, closing date is Sunday, so. Um, if, if you get distracted during today and you're writing an application, I won't, I won't uh, hold it against you. Uh, and obviously you get the prestige of being the learning te technologist of the year. Um, I'm conscious I'm, I don't want to cut into next speaker's time, so 
if there's more information about the CMOC on the website, uh, and we're very fortunate that Susan Gregg will be speaking about that at the end of the day as well, so I don't really need to say more about that. And so we can hand it over to our first speaker. We'll just say if you're at the end of this meeting, is it hashtag Alt-C? Yeah. yeah. Sam Coulter, um, obviously not Doug Steele, who unfortunately is ill and couldn't make it today. Um, I have had no involvement in the huddles, so if I'm standing reading a bit of paper, please forgive me. Um, I do know about medals, though, and I can help um, The huddles have been well received by the subject health reviews for the programmes and it seems to be going well. So, are you too busy to innovate? Um, surprising, but not unusual. Um, staff don't have time, or they don't have... Uh, yeah, they just don't have time, but it's not a priority. Um, so, we created these huddles and um, the huddles are meant to try and demonstrate small changes with little effort and a big difference. So they are roughly a discussion um, with the staff that come along and um, we discuss a low effort, high impact approach with tools, services, apps can be demonstrated in less than 15 minutes and that's including our discussion. It's a media relevant to a wide range of staff. It's accompanied by tutorial materials and it provides an opportunity for staff to meet like-minded individuals. Um, what it tends to do is book out an hour in the training room and every 15 minutes a new set of people come in. Or if he has a group, they'll say, right, okay, we'll do 15 minutes on presentations, 15 minutes on videos, 15 minutes of co-creation and something else. Or if they want, we'll take them and spend an hour on um, presentations. So 15 minutes on Sway, 15 minutes on Office Mix, 15 minutes on TouchCast and going for Bones. Uh, or going for GSB, which I'll explain a little bit because that's the medals. Um, so these are some of the um, topics that we cover with the huddle. Of Bill. So, although it couldn't be here in person, oh no, it did work earlier. Why is it not working now? I tested it. Which is to do with chemotherapy. 
So you can see up here, I've opened up the module in the middle, and then I've also opened up two uh, tabs from Twitter. And you'll see why I'm doing that later on. So the first thing you do is you log yourself into Twitter. If you don't have a Twitter account, go ahead and click Twitter account. It will take a couple of minutes. Once you're in Twitter, go to your profile settings, select settings, scroll down and pick widgets. And create a new widget. And the widget you're interested in is a search widget. We can use search for particular hashtag tags or particular handles. So the first hashtag we will put in is the code for the module, which is nurse 09, one zero nine. And then we're going to add some more terms. So put in space, capital R space. And I'm going to look for turn ready to chemotherapy. So the hashtag for chemotherapy. Uh, because I believe people will be uh, talking about that. I'll then have a search for other chemotherapy related items. So this is where I use that other tab. Otherwise, it will clear out my search. And I put in chemotherapy. When I do that, you'll see various things come up that are related to chemotherapy. So let's say I'm interested in that one. And then highlight the handle to troll C to copy into the widget, control V to paste. And then I'll put my lower term, space or space into the local version of Twitter and chemotherapy again and let's say I'm interested in this particular area so I'll highlight the handle again control C back into a search term control V I think that's enough to give a particular demonstration and you'll see this is what my Post Twitter feed or timeline will look like. So then you can watch it. And that comes up with some code. I do control C to copy that code and then into middle. In middle, uh, if editing isn't turned on, and then turn it on. And when you turn that on, and you go to the bottom of the left hand uh, panel, you get add a block. And I'm going to add an HTML block. So HTML, uh, I'll then find the HTML block, which is there. And I'm going to edit it, configure the block. And when I go to the block, you can give it a block title of a one. If you don't have all these uh, icons available in your editor, I'm going to do with this button. Uh, so click that, all your icons appear. Particular icon I'm interested in this one, which is an HTML source. So click on that. Do control V to post in the code that uh, was obtained from the Twitter application. Click update. Click save changes. And you will have a cross here, your Twitter timeline based on chemotherapy. So you've got a constant stream of updates. Now, when a student uh, gets into their particular Twitter application and they tweet a message, and they tweet it using the hashtag. In this case, nurse 09109, which is the first time for the module. And then, for instance, first is this message. And then they send that on Twitter. Then 
Nachbau abschmieren. Ein Twitter Feed eventuell. Mein Ticket wird natürlich ganz früh. Und Top. Und dann ein Ticket über Teil. Feedback, embedded media, whatever you have in your middle. 
So for Bronze, we try to make it nice and easy. So five students, uh, they have to collect 10 times. They have to have uh, at least one form in use, but when, when the template's set up for a new module, they automatically get a new forum. So that should be nice and easy for them. 10 resources, so that could be pages or labels or whatever. And five URLs. So it should be nice and easy. But it's not as easy as that works. Because what GSB does is if you have five URLs and a label, it sees a label and doesn't see the URLs. So when they're adding in, you have to add it as a resource and URL rather than label with links. And if the information's in a folder, it doesn't see the information in a folder, it sees a folder. So you need to make sure that everything's brought up. So for silver, we thought, you know, we'll give them some choice here. They have to have bronze and any four of these. But that was four of each element and not four choices or four quizzes. And we had a few, um, shall we say, naughty lecturers who were adding in choices and hiding it from the students or adding quizzes but no questions. <laughs> um, um, things like that. So, we decided that when we were going for gold, that we had to check it. We had to make sure that the information that they were putting out was being used. One of the biggest things was copyright. And as you know, they have a habit of um, reusing information that shouldn't be reused, shall we say. Um, and this is one of the things that the first thing you have to do for gold is make sure it's copyright free. So we've got a copyright division in the library, so they go to the library and make sure it's all copyright free. So that's silver, copyright free, and then it gets sent to us, the e-learning team, and we look through it to see um, that it's got some of these characteristics. So we make sure it's got um, good learning instruction design, um, that it's got um, assignments um, to, for the students' learning, it links back to the instruction design, and learning outcomes, all that kind of stuff. At the moment, we have one, <coughs> one goat, who was given it last week. <laughs> um, and then we get some future proof, and we've got platinum, which will be yeah, the way, 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 way old. Um, and for that, it's, it's going to be peer reviewed, and it's this, this, the cohort of students that will be able to nominate it. At the moment, the students don't actually see the GSB block, but for the gold, we did take the information and put it in an HTML block so the students could see that that particular module has gold. And hopefully, those students will see that and pass the information on, and then other students say, well, why does it matter for gold? Why is this better? Um, so, this is our status at the moment with regards to the GSP and we had how many more choices? We have 1520 modules and I see how many of that we have. and um, silver, and as I say, the one little gold there for our H&M department. Um, the figures compared to last year, because we've only run this for just over a year, um, we have 100 more silver. The one of that's the bronze transitioning into the silver, 100, or whether that's 50, we've got another new 50, um, we're not sure because we haven't um, delved into the figures just now. Um, but they do seem to be uh, picking up on it. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> any questions for Sam? Yeah, yeah I, I was really interested um, in your one more. 
Mojo. When we don't go to Mojo, because we've been in constant debates about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's like, but I teach it so differently, and you know, I don't want my students to see this. I met a group a few weeks ago, and we went through groups and groups with them, and they're like, oh yeah, we see now, but it's just that the fight was just unbelievable um, they were just so unwilling to share their information with other lecturers they're teaching the same subject they should be having the same material over the four um, campuses regardless of who's teaching them it should be the same when you deliver it face to face you can put your own slide yeah, on it exactly. do other um, colleges and universities have that? <laughs> so at the moment that's what we have is one module per um, unit of learning. But unfortunately what's happened now is we have a lot of um, members out with the EU. So we've got some colleges in Russia that we're working with and they have copies of the module but because of the international regulations or whatever it is, um, they can't see our students and our lecturers can't see their students and using the groups and groupings doesn't work because if they're and as a teacher they also have to see all the students so we're looking at using uh, meta modules and having um, just an assessment module so that um, the assessment modules where the, the Russian teachers will have access to that as teachers they'll have access to the general material as students and then that way it's kind of keeping it separate but keeping the majority of the information in the one um, in the same way we've got a lot of partners in Africa and stuff like that as well so um, we do have some modules at the moment that are sitting there with six different modules with it because of the uh, geographical Excluded groups tend to be some of the modules that, uh, like information modules, that maybe have like 10,000 students on it and will never ever get in there. Um, in development means they've got partially some of them uh, stuff with the bronze. So for instance, some of them will come and say, oh it's in development, it's in development. And what's happened is they'll have a label and they'll have their five URLs as links in there. And that, it's not seen, so we have to take that out and run as I do and it's thing. Is the middle like an open badge? Is it a, is it, is it, is it a digital badge? Or? No, no, it's, it's just for that particular module and um, yeah, it doesn't get shared to anybody else because I don't think anybody else would be interested in whether um, the chemotherapy has got a, a, a silver bronze unless it's that particular department. So. Can I ask a question of you people, the modules well, that's only for the foreign modules, so we don't have that for no modules. Sorry, I mean, I mean, you know, the same, you can put out the campuses teaching the same thing in the same module space, so they're all up and on and on. Would it be possible for one campus to get a medal and another one get a different medal in the same yep. space? How do they get a medal and the board together? Because they've started getting together, they've got to get together. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but when you find it's a module coordinator for that, tends to look after the module and they get the, the medal rather than the rest of the team or whoever's teaching it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the students, will they, they get a different um, experience? Do they talk to each other and say, we're like each other this way, there's great, we all understood it. And um, we never got that, we do something different or we, we got a field trip and you never get a field trip or... No, not really. But they tend to, they've all come back to, well, is that module rubbish? Or, and they say, right, okay, so, so why is it rubbish? What, what's rubbish about it? And try to get that information out of them, it can be quite useful sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And we've had the same problems in the institution, trying to tie, we were trying to tie it into the record system so that, or the, the, the record system so that a module could only be key, right, be key from, direct from the record system so that nobody could override it, but it never lasted long enough if we needed an extra module or a test module. Uh, we don't allow it. It just doesn't happen. Um, if they want them, uh, if they have a special reason because they're teaching it in Greek um, as well as in English, um, then you know they've put in a business case and like, no, it's fine. Just do groups and groups, and we can change that to 
It is no problem, no more. No, sorry, we'll help you with it. But you're not getting another module. Unless it's a legal application with the Russia and African and, and it's keeping the, the different students and lecturers apart. That's the only reason it is. You said you check the gold ones. Yes. They just do it automatically as soon as that's where, that's where the little naughty um, lecturers come in and say, Oh, I've added that and I've got a silver and okay. Um, so that's you can obviously. Yeah, um, when you go in, um, it's under like, settings um, admin uh, and you can just you just tick boxes if you like, um, and it gives you the room one or do they, do you have to check it? Uh, once you set it up, um, we set it up uh, and then it, the way it's sticky, so it, it automatically puts it on every single module and it just automatically calculates so it as soon as it's in that module. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they can go in and it, it, it's just outside. Yeah. yeah. Am I correct in thinking that one of the things or challenges you found was that, let's say, for the URLs, um, if they had it in a label, um, then that would just be counted as one and the same. Mm -hmm. So that means people are changing the design because sometimes it's quite nice to have things in the label. Yeah, uh, what we're trying to do is get them, we, we hate folders, mm -hmm. we don't like folders, and we try to get them to use sub-pages instead, mm -hmm. or use pages, um, and then if it's in a sub-page then it will count it because it automatically puts it into the orphaned activities, mm -hmm. so we'll see it within there. Okay. So there is, there is ways around it, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we, we, we find that if, Especially because the schools are starting to say, right, every module will have bronze by 2017. Um, so some of them are saying, well, why am I not getting bronze? What's happening here? And some of them is because they use it as a deposit, uh, deposit room, just dump stuff in it. The students don't want to look at it, so they're not getting the 10 clicks. Um, we use a, uh, another add in called Gizmo, and that allows us to check to see which students are clicking in, which aren't. Um, it gives us a quick count so we can see if they are getting an average of 10, because if they've got 102 students on that module, then it's a lot of clicks. Um, but yeah, they're getting there. They are getting there. I mean, they were kind of at the start, but yeah, they're starting to find. They've got a goal. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Is it long enough? Yes. I wasn't picking up to take a note to you earlier, but I really like doing this YouTube clip. Yes, I am. Thank you. the book that we've published and the other book that we will publish 
and who's been involved in it. It's a just funded project, um, and the question that we were setting out to answer, you can see on the screen there, will the institutions in e-textbook create help the students to provide a more affordable higher education and promote better, more sustainable information environment for library students and faculty? So there's a recognition that e-textbooks are expensive, um, they're not always easy for students to get to, that digital texts are easy to get hold of, um, but not always in the subject areas that you might want, or not always in the format that you might want. Um, just ask the teams, don't really like moving off the screens, um, I'm sure you can all read. To bid, to bid for the, the, the funding to trial the institution as a publisher, um, and we had to support a range of different activities within that, looking at reusability, accessibility, interoperability, durability, lots of abilities in there that we had to look at. And we had to try and make it available, almost ubiquitous availability, we had to try and make whatever we created available to everybody, everywhere, almost any time. There were four projects <coughs> under the umbrella, this just project, the institution is an e-publisher, textbook publisher. Um, you can see there, Liverpool, Nottingham, UCL and ourselves. Ourselves is a big one there. Um, Keith used to work at Edinburgh and Apia University and Keith was actually involved in this project before he came to work at the University of Highlands and Islands. The University of Highlands and Islands is involved in the project obviously, but mainly the Educational Development Unit, part of the, edu is the, the institution where I work, is the, is the main contributor. And one of the partners in the university, which is Lewis Castle College up the Western Isles, is also involved. Uh, Professor Frank Rennie is based there, and I'm sure many of you probably know Frank, he gets around a bit, um, was a main contributor to the first e-textbook from there. So the goals that, that, that we aimed was to, as I said, provide a more affordable education for the students, better value for money than the commercial alternatives. Everybody who has probably bought, an e -te or bought a textbook will know that sometimes the textbooks are 50, 60 plus pounds, they're absolutely massive tomes. Um, and generally you only really get them in libraries. Um, okay, and improve, we're looking for a sustainable information environment. Each of the four projects had to develop two uh, textbooks, two e-textbooks. And this is the, the different uh, areas that we're developing them in. Um, you can see there, there isn't exactly eight. Um, and that's because under the research methods, that is a, a, a sort of blanket umbrella for two of our textbooks um, and I'll tell you what they're called when we we'll get further on. Everybody's using different routes to publish and this is, this is some uh, graphics taken from just so insight. Um, you can see that an element of everything had to be open access. Uh, some of the projects are using the freemium model, some of them are print on, de print on demand. Um, we decided to use Amazon Kindle and you can see that we're the only one that's used Amazon Kindle. Um, and I'll tell you why that is, the reasons why we did that. Uh, different formats and platforms as well, so people are, are putting it out on different uh, platforms. Some of these platforms you'll recognise, I'm sure, uh, the obvious choice for Nottingham was Zerti, because they designed it, developed it, they own it, and they share it. Um, Liverpool using the Biblio board, um, Nottingham are also using Smashwords, so they, they're doing a model with the trial in one, way of, of delivery and then trial in another way and UCL uh, they put out PDL, PDF, HTML and Flash. And Flash is an unusual choice uh, and actually HTML is quite an unusual choice as well. We didn't know what they were doing when we started out and, and when we saw what they were doing we found it quite interesting. The reason we found it quite interesting was that the unit I work for develops mainly in HTML5, we develop learning, learning materials and we never considered for a moment that our learning materials developed in HTML5 would constitute an ebook. But it turns out that some of these uh, developers are actually developing HTML5 and classing it as an ebook. So it's a whole different classification as to what an ebook might actually be. Uh, <coughs> most, of you, most of you are will be used to ebooks in the format that, that Amazon probably sends them out here. You might even consider PDF as an ebook. Uh, PDFs are becoming more interactive, but we didn't even think that what we were already doing would be considered for an ebook, so it wasn't even part of our thinking at that time. So this is what we uh, hope to achieve. We publish two books, hope to publish two books. See, hoping the second book is, where is it now, Keith? It's with the proofreader, and we should hopefully publish it next week sometime before I go on holiday. Um, 
What we did in addition to publishing the two books is we developed companion websites for each book. So we developed that, an overarching uh, companion website in WordPress, and we've developed two subsites of that. And the thinking is that to be sustainable, we can develop further and further subsites of, of the ebook site. What we've got in the ebook site is we've got, lists, we've got lots of resources that you might want to use that are linked up to each chapter in the book. Uh, and we've got discussion areas in, in there as well. So we're trying to create communities within that space. I'll leave you to ask the question how well that's going later. Um, and to identify a sustainable transferable model, as we said earlier, we want to be able to take your ebook or, or take somebody else's ebook and say, okay, we can push this through the publishing process, get it online for you, switch on a companion website and get you all singing and all dancing. A companion website can be just for a course, it can be just for a cohort, it doesn't have to be for everybody, we can lock it down, we can put uh, security on it as well. So the publishing process for us, this is probably the main reason that, that I or my team got involved in this uh, <coughs> development. We do, as I say, develop HTML5 and the process for us of developing and publishing our HTML5 is very similar to the publishing process that we would use when publishing a book. So basically we, we design it, we go through the writing of it, we review it, we put it all together and then we publish it, which is very similar to what we already do. So we had defined processes in our institution already that we just transferred across and used them for publishing books. So why do we use Amazon? The answers are probably quite obvious to most people. Um, when you look back at the requirements, we had to have this ubiquitous recovery. Amazon's everywhere, the Kindle's everywhere, you can get an app for almost every device, <coughs> you, can of, you can put uh, the Kindle reader on it, you can get it on Apple, you can get it on Android, you can get it on Windows, you can get it everywhere. Um, and the readers, you know, the, the users were already there, so we didn't have a training issue with people having to learn how to use that, that device or that platform. The marketplace is already there, it's massive and obvious, and it's right out there. The publishing process is dead simple in Amazon Kindle. I suppose if you're reading that, you're thinking, they've just taken the easy route. Well, I suppose we did take the easy route. We, we thought, well, what's the, sim the simplest way to do this? What we wanted to do was to try and create a publishing process that was easy for anybody to do, um, and use tools that anybody could get access to. Um, we could switch on and off the, the DRM, and we also had the opportunity to enter KDP Select, which was really good for us, um, because it allowed us to do things with the, the, the book uh, that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. And it's free as well, so it doesn't actually cost you to use the Amazon service. It's already there. So the sales and statistics is quite interesting. Um, we decided to price the book at one ninety nine. <coughs> no gasps, good. Um, <laughs> and what we did was we really marketed the book at the start. This graph is it's quite difficult to see what this graph is actually saying. Um, the green line is the free sales. We put it free between the 9th of September and the 13th, and that's just a five day. Under KDP Select, you can elect to have your book go free for five days, and we did it in that period, which sort of makes the actual sales prior to that and, and subsequent to that seem quite insignificant, but they were quite significant with regard to book sales um, and, and the genre that this book was in. Um, it's since going up, it's maintained an average sales rank of 259, but in the week that it went free, it was actually number one within its, uh, its genre on Amazon, and it stayed there for two weeks. Keith informs me, <laughs> I'm playing this one in UK, Keith informs <laughs> us it was actually number one prior to it going on, on the free sale as well, um, which is interesting because we discussed why that might be, and the reason we come back to is that the books that generally sit in the genres that we chose don't actually sell that many copies. The actual books don't sell that many copies, and it didn't take us an awful lot to actually move up those rankings and hold that position. So anyway, you can see the figures there. The figures there, and um, the free week that we put up, I think we sold 2,100, but we never sold, we gave away 2,169 books. We've sold um, just over 3,000, or we've sold stroke, given away over just over 3,000 books uh, so far. Um, and with the distribution is worldwide, I mean, we've got universities, you know, in South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, um, all over the continent, over stateside, Canada, all using this book. We can see from the referrals um, and the, the, the URLs that they're coming from where these are being used, and some of them are actually in DLEs and other institutions, so we know that they're being used. Um, if I was to extend our sales um, beyond uh, this uh, date range here, you would see that they're very erratic, and we can absolutely coincide then with events where 
Keith or Frank Rennie or, or one of our good and the great have been out at some big conference and, and been showing people but that's all of a sudden we get this peak and then we get a drop off again. Um, let's move on, probably. Um, I guess it's you, Keith. <laughs> okay, so I'll just say a little bit about the uh, evaluation part of the project. <clears throat> It's not to be an LB project, I'm just really interested in this as a research project as well. Um, uh, and that applies to all four of the projects we funded under the, uh, the programme. Um, and what they're ultimately looking to do is to make available to the sector uh, a range of knowledge, guidance, toolkits, resources about the different ways in which institutions can position themselves as e-textbook publishers. Um, for us, we focused on a number of particular areas within the valuation strand of the e-text project. Um, Scott's touched upon some of these things already, um, but the production process, the offering process for book one was very much straightforwardly um, written um, from scratch. Um, book two we've taken more of a kind of curated type of approach, um, mixing you know, authorship with um, uh, repurposing existing content. Uh, then we look at the audience, um, how effective it is from a learning teaching point of view, um, and then what's happening around dissemination. Um, one of the things that we found quite interesting in this whole process, and I'll maybe come on and say a little more about this, um, is just how much insight going through this process in a relatively short amount of time has given us into how you can do these things quite straightforwardly um, uh, and, and you know, hopefully quite effectively. The other thing that um, has been quite interesting are the kind of softer, more qualitative aspects of this whole process, where you have academics working with colleagues who are designers technologists and developing the range of skills that would typically um, only really be found inside the commercial sort of publishing um, uh, company, so that's been quite interesting as well. Um, in terms of uh, some of the key aspects of the valuation, um, kind of where we're at in terms of uh, the end of year one a few months ago, um, just a few headlines here. The pre-production processes we found in terms of producing um, uh, e-textbooks versus conventional textbooks, if you like, are very, very similar um, in terms of um, authoring, deciding on, on um, the pitch of a book, um, <coughs> or um, all of those sorts of aspects. Um, but the, the, the process beyond that um, becomes really quite different. And there's a few things that we would probably pick up in particular at this stage. Um, I'm not going to go over all of these. Um, but we found that the, um, producing the first book has been a really big, quite steep learning curve, um, and the, the cost associated with that has probably been quite substantial. Um, we found the second book um, much easier because we've, we've gone through that first one and developed the whole process to do it, not just the, the book itself. Um, we can see a sort of um, trend where um, the, the cost of production of these things, if you like, um, will fall towards zero over time um, and become you know, uh, quite simple, quite um, efficient to actually take something and get it out of it quite quickly. And I'll talk in a minute about the other types of um, ways in which we hope to use this process in terms of publishing um, uh, texts and also student work as well. Um, I mentioned the different roles and certainly for us there have been lots of indications for um, around the notion of the academic um, as an author um, of e-textbooks and what that might mean in terms of them also um, to a certain extent um, being a publisher or being an editor, um, or being someone who gets their hands dirty, um, producing open, open educational resources, other types of technology that might support the book. Um, we're not sure where this might go, but I would say everyone has been involved in the process, the colleagues in academic roles, colleagues in supporting roles, um, development roles. Um, I think we've, across the team, um, developed a range of expertise it means if we take this forward in the, in the institution, we're going to be less dependent on traditional forms of publishing and that traditional kind of input we might have got if we're dealing with um, commercial publishers. As we get yeah, into the final year of this, um, uh, the valuation has um, moved from a focus on the process and what was involved um, more towards um, uh, I guess, impact, use. Um, there's a range of interviews and focus groups um, on, 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 underway at the moment um, with particular student groups who started to use the book, um, with academics. Um, we're trying to understand what's made the books um, uh, usable or useful. Um, one thing we, we 
I just read through the books is that they're, they're not kind of weighty tomes, they're designed to be um, practical books. Um, so if you're a student doing a research dissertation, uh, we almost imagine it as um, a book that we would give our students to say, before you read anything else, get started here. So it's lay of the land type information. Um, but I think for me what's, what's most interesting in some of this is where it might go. So we've developed this process uh, and, and we've begun to develop some expertise uh, around producing e-textbooks for students within the organisation, uh, within the two, within the APR and also at the UHI. Um, we're starting to realise that there's a whole range of ways in which we can apply that process um, to more usefully share some of the work that our academics and our students do within the, the institution. Um, one of the things we're exploring at the moment is can this process be used to take good research um, or, or knowledge exchange activities or, or staff might be involved in and get them out there to the sector in a way that's much quicker, much more efficient than going through a traditional publishing route. Um, uh, and, and are there ways to look at where funded projects, for example, might publish um, uh, uh, scholarly research outputs in, in you know, national journals, but before they can get to that point, they can quickly make the more useful aspects of what they've, they've um, produced um, publicly available. So we're looking at you know, what's the potential to streamline getting useful knowledge out of the university um, and do it in a way that's quicker than going through traditional publishing routes. We're also really interested in what this might mean in relation to digital scholarship for our students uh, and the notion of our students as public scholars. So we're starting to um, now talk about whether we could take the ETIPS process, if you like, we've developed and use it as an opportunity to publish the best students' work but when we're talking about the best student work, we're not talking about dissertations that got the highest marks. That, that's not what, we're, what we mean. We're talking about uh, that student work, those dissertations at honours level, those master's dissertations, maybe PhDs, um, that would have um, the most relevance to a particular community or for a particular issue, um, so that the, the impact of that student work um, uh, can resonate beyond the university and beyond the course that we produced it within. Um, so our idea of best student work is let's, let's get the ETHIPS process, uh, process and use it to quickly bring to the surface um, student work that could have an impact um, within the community, within the business sector, the research sector, whatever the context might be. Um, I don't think there's anything else we'll pull out in particular there. Um, the slides we made available, there's a few links we can share to the papers we've written up around this process. Um, so we'll probably just leave it there, but it gives you a feel of the project and some of the things that are starting to emerge through the evaluation process um, and, and where we hope to take it as well. That's great, thank you very much. Some of the best student work, um, as I say, we're not talking highest grades or whatever, but, but even some of the best college student work won't necessarily be publishable. Um, and some of the work that might be most interesting may not necessarily have um, um, done that well in terms of formal assessment because of how it's been presented. So that proofreading process and, and the aspects that surround that um, would ensure that the student work is lifted to that publishable standard as well. So for us, that, that, that externality in terms of proofreading and uh, quality assurance, if you like, for want of a better term, is it's really important to have a process. So Amazon themselves um, have no requirements? No. Yeah. 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 Sorry, does that just include the quality aspect of it, the content, as well as the proofreading for you know, Yeah, it's, the just, it's full consistency, right. yeah, linkages, links to externals. Yeah, I mean, the quality of the content in terms of... Mm. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. It's well, the content, content is covered by the peer review, which is an internal, so we have mm. experts out internally peer reviewed. Okay. The proofread itself is mainly to do with the, the structure, the grammar, the uh, consistency through, throughout. The, the adheres to the grammar style guide, so it adheres to the style guide as well. Uh, what sort of tools do you use to create the 
be, but did you use anything to it document? Was pretty, it, was pretty, it was pretty standard. I was waiting for that question, actually. And it, I was going to say, but I thought somebody's going to ask it anyway. Um, we, we tried to stay, as I said, with free tools. We started, uh, or we originally started using the open, open office to do the basic text processing, but we discovered that most people actually have work. And actually, because we had it in our machines, the institution, and trying to get other products installed in our machines is an absolute nightmare because of the admin restrictions. We decided just to go with work, but for, for work, read open office if you want to use the open office products. And then we use Calibre and Sigil, which are both free products to actually uh, structure the book, make sure it was all read for publishing, and we put it in HTML, put it in HTML, and then put it in the and, and mobile format. So it was free tools we used the whole way through. That was part of the sustainability and trying to make a low cost uh, product. Okay. There's some interesting tools that you can start looking at if you're looking at control of the and actually get some groups of people together to write to books. Yeah, we, we, I suppose that, um, we want to do a lot more. Um, and we will do a lot more after the project. We sort of got to a stage where we had to get the project done because we committed to the project. And one of the things we found running run through the project, sorry I'm taking up time, just cut me short, um, is that staff are really pushed for time. Um, it's difficult to get academic staff to do the writing. They've pulled in a hundred different directions. I actually managed the project, or, or I was the editor for the project, so I was actually trying to control academic staff and, and people at Keith who are here, there, everywhere, and you know, not that hard to get hold of, it's hard for them to get time to do it. So that was uh, really difficult for us um, to handle uh, that part of it. Maybe just add something briefly to that, which is around, um, you know, I think alluded to the fact we've started to explore different ways of authoring. Um, so with the second book, we've taken a, an approach where um, a fair bit of the content has been written from scratch, but some of it has been repurposed from things that we know work well within existing modules and programs within the university. Um, and I think going forward, um, that's where some of this might become a bit more sustainable. Um, if you look at the, the, the knowledge artifacts, if you like, you know, the resources that are, that are typically within a, a university or college anyway, and harness those in the process. Okay. One of the big issues we had with the project was that we couldn't ingest the Amazon Kindle book into our library system. And most institutions won't be able to do that easily, take a, a Kindle book into their library system for lending out to the students. We found it really difficult to distribute that book to students. So one of the other avenues we're looking at is other ways we can publish things like Smashlogs and um, print on demand so that we can get the book to the students easier um, and how we might get it into the library catalog and the, the institution. That was a real tough one for us and we ended up having to get about or having to sell, not give away actually, we gave them, we gave them basically Amazon tokens to go and buy our own book so the students can get access to it. That's if they missed it in the free week. We really published, they publicized the free week, hoping that they would get it in the free week. But some students missed it, so we ended up having to buy the book, basically, for them to get the book. So they could get the book, which was a wee bit of a pain. We only did that on a few occasions, but it was, it was and that is a difficulty when you e-publish you know, on the Amazon Kindle platform. And they restrict you as well. If you enter into the Kindle Select program, you cannot sell it or give it away anywhere digitally other than Amazon, so you're all absolutely locked in. Thanks very much, actually. Thank you. Right, next up, we've got Gavin Boyd from Edinburgh College talking about mobile lending lens. Thank you very much. Uh, just before we begin, you should actually be able to see an embedded video up here, so please check this first of all, make sure the videos are working. Yeah, I think. Gavin Boyd, I teach at Edinburgh College, I teach core skills numeracy. So I have between three and four hundred students ranging from hairdressers, beauty therapists, and those who are to do primary school teaching at university, and also some nurses as well. So we've got a wide variety of students that I teach, and they all have a common problem. They struggled at school with maths or numeracy. Okay. So I've been working for the last couple of years creating innovative content using different apps create short teaching style videos, which the students do like, they're quite popular with the students, but they weren't actually watching them on Moodle, okay? So I think you agree, with a lot of students, they're addicted to their smartphones, so I thought, 
let's turn that to an advantage, combine the QR codes to make the uh, videos quite accessible. So I'm just going to hand over to my co-presenter and he's going to talk a little bit about QR codes. Let's uh, shoot work over here. Do you recognise this? It's called a QR code. Look out for it on your worksheets and handouts. If you scan it with your phone, it may link to a video, a website, or other relevant material. If you don't already have a QR code reader on your phone, then you need to download a free app. Do it now. Okay, so if you've got your smartphone switched off, could you please switch it on or your other mobile devices? And then you go into the App Store and look for a QR reader or QR scanner and download a free app. Don't be paying any money for this. So we're looking for a QR reader or QR scanner in, the, in your App Store and download it. And while you're doing this, I'm going to be talking about this. This is the most important slide. So if you want to pay attention to any of my presentation, this is the one to look out for. So I've got these worksheets. So this is the worksheet here. You can see this is what I give to my students. You see it's got a QR code on it. So I'm going to pass these round. And if you look at the very back page, it's got the most important slide on it. Okay? So you can scribble any extra notes on there. So it won't come to It's like Blue Peter. He's one I made earlier. Okay, so I'll pass these round. There should be plenty. I have 50 printed off, so there should be enough for one person. So I'm going to pass this So just while I'm talking you through this, be downloading the QR reader app on your phone and as soon as you get the worksheet, if you see a QR code, scan it and see what happens. Okay? So this is one of the worksheets that I've given you. So I hand these to my students and you can see it's got a QR code on it. So it means if the student comes in late, for example, misses the 15 minutes, very important, the start of a uh, lesson, they don't know what to do, they don't know what it's all about. They can scan this with their phone, watch the short teaching video that explains what they have to do, and then do the rest of the worksheet. It's working. Someone's had some success, right? If you hear somebody talking about Bill and Ben, that's the first worksheet. So that is working for some people. So the point about this is also you include uh, the actual worked example the old-fashioned way. And I need to talk over Bill and Ben here. <coughs> So if their phone's not working or their battery has died, then obviously you give a worked example. So all the worksheets I've given you do have QR codes, but they also have a worked example printed there as well, so students can see what they're actually doing. Alright? So how do I create these videos and how do I create the QR codes to go with them? Well, I use two different apps. I use my iPad, so everything goes through the camera roll. Okay? So when we're talking about app smashing, what does that mean? Some of you might have heard of the term. It just means that you're using two or more apps in combination to produce a finished product, in this case a short teaching video. Okay? So everything goes through the camera roll on my iPad. What I do is I take a photograph of the worksheet, open up the Telegami app, which is this, the avatar chap you saw a minute ago, use that as the background, introduce the topic, explain what the student has to do, save that to a YouTube channel, okay? and YouTube channel's pretty easy to set up, it's free, so that's your question video, right? Then it opens up the Explain Everything app, again use the same photograph background, and then it's basically it's like a, a small whiteboard. Sketch out the answer, save that to a YouTube channel, and then create a QR code for it, links to it on YouTube, and then paste that to the, to the worksheet. And that's the whole process. Okay, any questions on that? No? So I've just mentioned briefly the apps. Telegami, quite inexpensive. There's a free version available, or if you're willing to splash out £3.99, <laughs> you can record uh, 90 second videos. So the free, ver free version is 30 second videos. The £3.99, you get a 90 second video. Um, so what, I do, what you do is you create the scene. You can choose a male or female character, what they look like. For the background, I tend to use the worksheet question. And then for the voiceover, I tend to use my own voiceover, or there's a text-to-speech function which you can use. Sometimes it's a little bit robotic, so that's why I tend to do my own voiceovers. 
And then you call it a GAMI, that's what they call the video you've created, a GAMI, Teladami. So I save that to my camera roll, export that to YouTube, and then carry on with it. Okay? So that's the, the question usually. And then to explain everything, as I mentioned earlier, it's a little bit like having a mini whiteboard on your iPad. So again, I use the same background, usually the worksheet question, sketch out the answer and do the voiceover, save it to my camera roll, export it to YouTube, and then splice it together with the question. So we have the question and answer, that's your finished product. Okay. So this is the, one of the worksheets that I gave you. If you maybe switch off your phones or turn them to mute, um, when I give the students the worksheets, they'll see this first. So they've always got the worked example if the phone's not working. So they scan this if they come in late. It's also very useful for the flipped classroom. So I'll play this video just in case anybody didn't have a success with it, so you can see what's supposed to come up. Some of you have heard Bill and Ben, but I'll play it on the full screen so you can see it better. Bill and Ben share 18 pounds in the ratio of two to one. How much do they get? Bill and Ben share 18 pounds in the ratio of two to one. How much do they get? Well, let's have a look. Bill gets two shares or chunks. We'll draw it like this. And Ben gets one share or chunk. So how many shares or chunks do we have? Well, we have three. So how much is a share or chunk worth? Well, 18 pounds divided by three equals six pounds. So that's how much each share or chunk is worth. So this one is worth six pounds. This one is worth six pounds. This one is worth six pounds. So we add those together. Bill gets how much? Bill gets 12 pounds. And how much does Ben get? Well, Ben only gets one share, which is worth six pounds. And if we add 12 and six pounds, we get a total of 18 pounds, so that's correct. So Bill gets 12 pounds and Ben gets six pounds. That's our final answer. So how many people had success actually seeing that? Many of you? A few of you? So if you didn't have any success, you've seen the video, you can also try again later. But I find also with the less able students that this visual style works quite well. This is the Singapore bar method, so it's quite useful for students. So it's not a maths lesson, but the whole idea is think how you could use this with your students. Okay. Right, I wanted to play this one to show you how you can produce some nice contextualised materials. <laughs> Uh, the CD Rome in the corner here, this was a, a healthcare unity project. Uh, it was a collaborative venture between Julianesque Valley College as was and Fourth Valley College. Uh, so this was probably eight years ago. So I played a small part in this. I produced some PowerPoints that are on the CD Rome went to all the colleges and universities in Scotland. So I thought I'd update it using my apps, using the telegram and explain everything. So I'll play this and you can see it's nicely contextualised. The use of colour, so I've got the prescription and the drug label. So basically it's a combination of telegrammy and explain everything. So I'll just play the video just to let you see an example of contextualisation. Here is a prescription and a label from a bottle of curel syrup. How much curel do you give the patient? Your patient has been prescribed 100 milligrams of Curol. Curol is available as a 50 milligram per 5 ml syrup. What does this mean? It means that there are 50 milligrams of the drug in every 5 ml of the syrup. So if you give your patient 10 ml of syrup, that would be equivalent to 100 milligrams. So in other words, 2 times a 5 ml spoon. That's what the patient needs to get. There is another way to do this calculation. What you want over what you've got times what it's in.
what you want is a prescribed dose of 100 milligrams. What you've got is 50 milligrams times what it's in, 50 milligrams for every 5 mils. So work out that calculation and it gives an answer of 10 mils of syrup. In other words, two 5 mil spoons worth. Your patient has been prescribed 100 milligrams of Cure-All. It's available as a syrup, 50 milligrams per 5 mil. This means you've got 50 milligrams of drug in every 5 mils, so you could give them two spoons worth, which would be 10 mils. Or use the formula, what you want over what you've got times what it's in. 100 milligrams divided by 50 milligrams times 5 mils equals 10 mils of syrup, or two 5 mil spoonfuls. It was a little bit rushed at the end there, because that was the cheapo free version. <laughs> <laughs> so that was in 30 seconds. So you can see, if I was using the 90 second, I can make it slightly longer, but you can also splice videos together as well. It can be a wee bit time consuming, but that's why that was a wee bit rushed at the end there. But you can see the use of colour. I basically visited the hospital in Edinburgh to see how the, how the nurses were being taught numeracy. And it was very interesting because the lecturer was very hands-on when it came to injecting. They were injecting into sponges and it was very hands-on. She was obviously very comfortable with that. And then when it came to the numeracy part of it, she, the person who basically gave out a worksheet was just text and more or less handed out to students. Whereas this, you can see, we've got the prescription, we've got the label, we've got what that actually means, 50 milligrams per 5 mil, so the use of colour as well. There's also different formula you can use stock dose and all the rest of it, this is very easy to remember. It's not a mass lesson, but you can see, you can make this very user-friendly rather than a boring worksheet. It's much more than that now. Okay. This is one of my favourite ones, so I'm quite proud of this one. <laughs> so. so these are some of the worksheets. I'm not going to play the videos for this, I'm aware we're kind of short on time. So there's two videos associated with this, the two different forms of calculation. This is on pie charts. It's a modified version of a worksheet from a colleague, Anna Clickstow, so I've changed that a little bit. So thank you, Anna. Uh, so turn to the video, you see a video. So I'm not going to play that. You can play that video later when you get a chance to, to watch it on YouTube. So that's the video you would see. And that's the percentages of the video. And then there's one to do with mortgage calculations. And you can see a wee bit of Singapore bar methodology there, which is quite visual. Again, I'm not going to play this video with a bit of It's the video associated with it. So I just want to finish to mention that the students do like this. I recently won an award with the Edinburgh College Students Association for Innovation in the Classroom. I don't know who nominated me, but uh, that was very nice of them. So they do like it. It's very popular. I have 32,000 views and counting on my YouTube channel. Uh, it's very good for the flipped classroom. It's very good for people who have been off sick to catch up. Students like it, it's working, it's early days yet. I've only been pushing the QR codes for one year now, so I'm learning as I go along, but it is working. And I think you can maybe benefit from something like this. So thank you very much. Question. What I would say, the very fact that I did use the, the free version, that forced me to do 30 seconds. So sometimes when you have a constraint, it can be positive because you really have, it's like on Twitter, if you're doing a tweet, you have to really condense it and think what do you need. It's the same idea. So I know you can splice videos together, and now I've got the luxury of a 90 second video. <laughs> and so I would say two or three minutes, really, because uh, the students are doing this on the go. I've got smartphones, I wouldn't make it any longer than that. It may be different for different cases, students, but the students I work with, they want something that's short and sweet. I call, I call them boydy bites. So Gavin Boyd, <laughs> bite sized chunks of learning. And they like it. It works. So three, maybe three minutes tops. You, you're using Telegram and. Explain everything, yes. Yeah, explain everything. Did you have to merge them together and wait for you to talk to? Uh, well, what you do is you create the Telegram video, that's usually the question. 
you create the explain everything video, that's usually the answer. Send them to a YouTube channel and then use the YouTube video editor, you can splice them together. Do you see doing YouTube? And you can splice together as many as you like. You can have half a dozen all spliced together if you want to. It's usually two or three. How long does it only take to create the uh, Good question. Um, how long is a piece of strength? Sometimes you can do these quite quickly. But if it's a combination of videos, like see the one for the job calcs, that was essentially three videos that spliced together. So that would take a bit longer than maybe just a Q and A. So it could take a morning to do one, or it could take half an hour. Just depends. Well, we give somebody else a chance. Have you had any interest from other critical areas to do this? Um. I promoted it to my colleagues. Uh, it's, I know that one of my colleagues was looking for the Moodle course that my colleague George Gordon and I put together that includes all these videos. They're wanting to promote that as kind of best practice within the college. So I've been talking to people about it, but nobody's really kind of doing it apart from me, as far as I know. Do you think it's about, uh, as, as you know, we don't have time to do it? I was wondering if in your college or anybody else that you have protected CPD time. Um, <laughs> what I would say is that I've, I've, made, I've made hundreds of videos, right? But what, what tends to happen is that, say, this time of year when maybe classes are starting to end, that's when I get a chance to actually make some videos, or maybe just before Christmas things get a little bit quieter. So you do try to make time, but when you're very busy, I've got you know, 22 hours of classes, so 400 students, nearly you're quite busy. So I tend to do it maybe different times of the year, so it's seasonal. That, that might work, but uh, just, it's just having a willingness to try things. I, I would recommend you get onto Twitter, follow lots of teachers on Twitter, and you can steal ideas from them. These are not all my ideas, I'll just be looking at ideas from them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, just go onto Twitter, and you can, you can actually even connect with teachers all around the world and see what they do. The next thing I want to try is the green screen. You may have heard of that. There's an app called Do Ink Green Screen. So that's the video one video thing, so you may want to try that one. Not quite sure how to use it in practice, but that's one of the things I'm interested in. Yes, Benji. <laughs> it, it is a similar question. I, I understand the difficulty of getting other lecturers and other subject areas to use. As far it. as I know, nobody else says it's What about within the university, within the Edinburgh College itself? Do you think that other lecturers, your colleagues, would use your worksheets? And your yes, some people do, and that's fine. If they do, that's great. If they don't, that's great. They also turn it up to them. But it's there that they want. We do share stuff. Like I say, I've modified one of the worksheets that was there, the pie chart, that was one of my colleagues. So we do share stuff. Yes. So really, that's a really quick one. Quick one. The voices of the Italiani, where does it come from? Do you use or...? Uh, I do the voiceovers, uh, or if you want, there's a text-to-speech function, which I find is a little bit robotic, so I tend to do my own voiceovers. Excellent. It's just, it's just a question. I had an academy and all the other kind of things that are out here. I know for some of these learners that's going to be too complicated to move on. Are some of these other tools used in the, in the college or...? or, or uh, some people may use Khan Academy or point a student in that direction. Yeah. Yes. But I think Khan Academy, maybe some of that's probably higher level stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah, depends on the other kind of student. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.